An introduction to Puccini's La Boheme. That frenetic, hyper-energized theme represents a group of young, starving artists in a garret in the Paris of the 1840s. We'll call them Bohemians, not because they're from Bohemia and Eastern Europe, but because that term was used in the 19th century for rebels against society, for the hippies of the time. The title La Boheme means the Bohemian girl, and as usual Puccini has chosen to name this opera after his soprano heroine. La Boheme is certainly the most popular, best-loved opera in the world. Other works have contested that claim over the last century or more. Our great and great-great-grandparents worshipped Gounod's Faust. A little later, once people had got over the shock of the subject matter, Carmen ruled the world stages, and Aida has its impassioned admirers. But we are right, surely, in claiming that La Boheme is the best-loved opera in the repertory. Because, of course, La Boheme is the quintessential parable on young love. Deeply tender, often tempestuous and impassioned, it is also a melancholy work, and the tale of young people falling in and out of love against a background of demoralising poverty has exercised an amazing attraction. Critics say the poverty is sanitised, and that is true to the extent that Puccini's exquisite music sweetens everything it touches, but there is real life and real suffering in this opera, as we shall show. Puccini was born in Lucca in northern Italy in 1858 and received a good musical education, first from his musical family and later at the conservatory in Milan. Legend says that it was a performance of Aida in Pisa in 1876 that inspired the lad to become a composer. But like many another great composer, his first works were not a huge success. Lovili based on the same tale as the Ballet Giselle, and Edgar, which was launched in 1889 at La Scala, no less, but sank soon after. His first smash hit was the opera Manon Lesco, based on a novel by the Abbe Prévost. And this lovely, lyrical work is still a firm part of the operatic repertory. You can get a sense of Puccini's wonderful way with the voice, in this case the tenor voice, in a short extract from the aria Donna non vidi mai. There then followed a period of wonderful creativity in which Puccini produced a string of works which are among the great masterpieces of the opera stage. La Boheme in 1896, Tosca in 1900, and Madame Butterfly in 1904. It would be impossible to think of presenting an opera season anywhere in the world without including one or all of these works in the repertoire. La Boheme we shall explore in a moment, but let us remind ourselves of the tenderness of Madame Butterfly best exemplified perhaps in the ravishing solo Un Bel Di, One Fine Day, in which the butterfly looks to the expected day when her lover will return. the other end of the scale, the power and majesty of Tosca, set among the splendours of Baroque Rome during the Napoleonic era. (laughs) 
Puccini had wonderful facility as a composer, but make no mistake, his success came as a result of hard work and intense ambition, driving himself and his librettists to breaking point. The libretto for La Boheme, the book, as you would say, on Broadway, occupied Italy's two finest librettists, Giacosa and Illica, for three years. And it shows. La Boheme has a great story and interesting characters, but it is the intensely romantic music and Puccini's superb melodic gift which make it the masterwork it is. And make no more mistakes, in addition to being a huge crowd pleaser, La Boheme is also a work of genius. It is, perhaps, the supreme masterpiece of the composer Giacomo Puccini, who inherited Verdi's mantle and virtually defined the art of opera at the end of the 19th century. It wasn't always like that, because like so many other successful works in the repertory, it was not a huge success at its first night. And this, despite having a talented young fellow called Toscanini conducting the orchestra. It was not a total disaster, but it did certainly take the Turin audience by surprise. Why? A work that is so instantly and melodically attractive? For one reason, it deals with what then would be regarded as a fairly immoral theme. Young people falling in and out of love and in and out of bed. For another, it does deal with poverty, and not a romanticised, comfortable depiction of poverty that a well-fed middle-class audience could admire. Instead, it deals with poverty in a true-to-life way, in a verismo manner, to borrow an Italian word that has come to be applied to this late flowering Italian school of, I hesitate to call it, kitchen sink opera. But in time, La Boheme came to impress itself upon the opera audience and became one of the three most popular operas ever written. It has the most likeable group of stage characters of any opera. It is bittersweet in its depiction of young love, and it has a score that is full of marvellous melodic invention by the composer who succeeded Giuseppe Verdi as the leading provider of the favourite art form of Italy. La Boheme is unusual, though not unique, in that it is based upon a novel. Most operas of the 19th century are based on plays, and indeed there are numerous cases where a fairly successful play was turned into a triumphant opera. Sardou's La Tosca and Belasco's Madame a Butterfly are two examples from Puccini's output. You could go so far as to say no one nowadays would ever have heard of those plays if Puccini hadn't made them into operas. The novel in question is called Scène de la Vie de Bohème, Scenes from the Bohemian Life, by Henri Murger. Puccini was a master of the theatre and, like Verdi, knew what would work and what would not work on the stage. So he and his librettists selected only certain incidents from the novel, eliminated characters, amalgamated others, and produced a very short but effective work. Indeed, La Boheme may have the distinction of being the shortest work in the popular operatic repertory, with a net running time of only 98 minutes. In brief, the story is simply this. The young poet, Rodolfo, meets and falls in love with the seamstress, Mimi. His friend, Marcello, has a more tempestuous affair with the lively Musetta. Rodolfo and Mimi move in together but their romance is clouded by his jealousy and by arguments, and they repeatedly separate and are reunited. In a final and deeply touching reunion, they meet again in the freezing garret where it all began. But it is too late. Mimi succumbs to that bane of operatic sopranos, consumption, and dies. Puccini has the good sense in this opera to make use of that grand-sounding device known by its German term of Leitmotiv, but which is basically just a theme which depicts a certain character, emotion or situation, a signature tune, really. In the opening pages of the opera, we hear the lovely, ardent, youthful theme that will be associated with the tenor hero Rodolfo. Marcello and Rodolfo have come to symbolise for us the concept of the starving, young, penniless artist, and as the curtain rises, they are working at their respective crafts in a freezing garret 
high above the streets of the Paris of the 1840s. Rodolfo, as we said, is a poet. His flatmate Marcello is a painter. There is a rich vein of humour running through La Boheme, and perhaps one of the things that disconcerted the first night audience was, is this a tragedy? Is it a comedy? Because La Boheme can be both, and sometimes even concurrently. There is a stove in the middle of the flat, but, alas, no fuel for the stove. Rodolfo has been working on a mighty verse drama and decides that it should be sacrificed to warm them. So, to the amused comments of Marcello, the great work of art is consigned to the flames. But temporary help is on the way because Shona, the musician, and another of the four young men who share the flat, returns from a gig, as musicians call it, with food and fuel and some spare change. In a typical bohemian response, they decide they will take the money and go blow it at the Café Mumus, a fashionable local restaurant. A wonderfully comic incident intrudes just before they can leave, when the landlord, Benoit, arrives to collect the arrears of rent. The boys dispose of him by a clever device. They invite him to talk about his adventures as a lover, then feign shock at such rampant immorality and shove the old man out of the flat. It is the sort of high-spirited happening that sets us up for the tender romantic material to follow. When three of the men go on to the cafe, Rodolfo remains behind to finish an article, and the scene is set for the climax to the first act, the extended love scene between Mimi and Rodolfo. Architectural literalists in the audience seem to have a problem with the fact that while the boys live in the garret, or top floor of this palace tenement, Mimi seems to have a flat above them. But we can assume that her poverty is of an even deadlier kind, and she has some tiny closet high under the eaves. At any event, Rodolfo is left alone, writing, when a woman's voice is heard off stage. As she says her name, the orchestra first timidly, then more confidently, spells out Mimi's theme tune. All composers have their idiosyncrasies, so it is tempting to ask, what do Mimi, Madama Butterfly, and Tosca all have in common? The obvious answer is that they are all Puccini heroines. The smart answer is that they are all heard off stage before we see them. A quirk of Puccini's, no doubt intended to build interest and anticipation for the female characters Puccini so obviously and clearly loved. The scene that ensues is in three parts. And the situation is this. Mimi has lost her key and asks Rodolfo for help finding it. They search in the darkness, their hands touch, and he sings his famous aria to her tiny, frozen hand. She has an autobiographical aria, They Call Me Mimi. And then they have a duet, which, as we'll hear, is operatic emotive writing of the highest order. He would need to have a heart of stone not to be moved by this scene that ends the first act of La Boheme. In the course of this opera, we shall demonstrate Puccini's complete mastery of his craft, which is sometimes evident in very strange ways, 
in his silences, in melodies which are only repeated notes, even in the use of dialogue when you expect music. Listen for a few seconds as the young people's hands search the floor for the missing key. Feel the frisson as their hands touch. Masterly. It launches Rodolfo on his aria, Cagelida Manina. What a cold little hand. Listen to that opening phrase. Have you noticed something very interesting about that marvellous melody, one of the most famous and best-loved tunes in opera? This is another Puccini trademark. It is hardly a tune at all. It is all one note repeated nine times before there is any change in the pitch. But it tells us something important about the nature of melody. Like much else in art and life, it has to do, we think, with tension and release of tension. The repeated notes build a tension and expectation so that when a new note is sung, our hearts turn over. Let's hear that again. Rodolfo develops his aria with a second subject, another meltingly lovely phrase, as they continue their search for the key. And he says, our search is useless. And then he has a phrase which should stop every heart in the theatre. Two lovely eyes have stolen every wealth from my store of hidden treasures, he sings. Listen, if you will, for the ardency of youth, all the energy of first love, wonderfully expressed in an arching, soaring melody which seems to exploit all that's best in the tenor voice. After the overwhelming emotional impact of Rodolfo's aria, there is a very telling pause, a tiny silence, before Mimi responds. Si, mi chiamano Mimi. Yes, they call me Mimi. And she adds, uh, for operatic trivia buffs perhaps, but my real name is Lucia. Puccini loved women, in life and in art, and his writing for women is always his most tender and caring. Here is a phrase for Mimi, the seamstress, talking about her work embroidering flowers. These flowers give me pleasure. In magical accents they speak to me of love and springtime. And the simplicity, the feminine charm of the melody, makes it entirely credible that Rodolfo would fall in love with her at first encounter and in the dark.
but the part of the aria which always makes me fall in love with Mimi comes at the end of the aria when her essentially optimistic nature is revealed. She lives at the very top of this run-down tenement in a room that's presumably freezing cold, inaccessible and bare. But, in Italian, ma, but when the thaw comes, ma quando viene lo cielo, il primo sole mio, the first rays of the sun are mine. You really feel this marvellous, refulgent phrase is music from the bottom of Puccini's heart. After a rude interruption from the other boys down below in the street, inserted purely, I'm sure, to give us a break between moments of high emotion, we have one of the loveliest, most tender duets in opera. Fans of the movie Moonstruck will not need reminding that this melody is the very heart and soul of the opera. Rodolfo begins, O suave fanciulla, O sweet girl. Then the young lovers weave their voices together in the most tender and sensuous fashion. As the duet ends, you will hear the lovers depart the stage en route to the Café Momus. And they end the duet off stage, a daring and innovative idea. Mimi goes up to an ethereal pianissimo top C. And the tenor, on this recording at least, has the musical good taste to take the lower note written by Puccini and complete the harmony rather than trying to bellow a sea of his own, as is so often and regrettably done nowadays. The duet ends the first act of La Boheme.
We move now to the second act, set in the Café Momus. It is marvellous that on discs we are able to go straight from the love duet to the frantic energy of the Paris street scene on Christmas Eve, because the contrast is wonderful. But in most stage productions, we need an intermission to change the scenery for what has been described as the most exciting 18 minutes in opera. This scene is to La Boheme what the grand march and triumphal scene are to Aida. It has it all. Crowds, a marching band, children's chorus, comedy. But like the Verdi scene, it plays a pivotal role in the opera. We shall meet Musetta the other woman of the opera, who is as outrageous and flighty as Mimi is gentle and soulful. That opening theme in the orchestra is important and will reappear later in strange guise, so let's hear it again. And the short chorus of vendors and peddlers doing their business of selling to the crowds of Christmas shoppers. who went ahead have secured a table on the sidewalk in the middle of winter. <laughs> Typical. And here is the tender moment when Rodolfo, first shyly, then with confidence, introduces his newfound love, Mimi, to his friends. Questa è Mimi. This is Mimi. And we'll stay with him as he explains who she is, up to the point where the boys comically pronounce Mimi worthy to join their august company. Questa è Mimi, Gaia Fioraia, il souvenir completo, la bella compagnia.
contrast plays a part in any successful theatre piece, and soon onto the stage flounces Musetta. Her extravagant, over-the-top manner is wonderfully captured by the orchestra as she arrives with Alcindoro, her latest ageing admirer. All to the amused comments of the Rodolfo party at the next table. There is some pretty competitive snapping back and forth between Musetta and her on and off boyfriend, Marcello. The affair seems to be off at the moment, and Musetta has two thoughts, probably not more, in her mind to catch Marcello's attention and to annoy Alcindoro. She succeeds brilliantly in both goals with the dazzling aria, Quando me en vo. It is a waltz, which may be an anachronism. I'm not sure there were waltzes in 1840s Paris. But that point aside, this is one of the best tunes even this opera has to offer. Maybe the shortest major aria ever written, and yet a memorable portrait in music of a lovable rogue. Quando me en vo. Not surprisingly, the aria ends with Marcello back in Musetta's arms, where he belongs, and we are set up for the final two minutes of this thrilling act. 
The bill for the young people's dinner is presented, and the boys have insufficient money to pay for it. Musetta solves this dilemma by having it added on to Alcindoro's bill. A marching band comes through. The children sing and cheer. Musetta is borne aloft by the grateful students, and the curtain falls on a crestfallen and presumably much poorer Alcindoro. Here are the last two of the most exciting 18 minutes in opera. The third act of La Boheme is as bleak as the second was festive. But, ma, point number one, it is the emotional core of the opera. Two, it is the greatest act in this opera, perhaps the greatest in all Puccini's output, and one of the handful of great acts in all opera. Why such praise? Because to the usual components of a great dramatic situation and glorious music is added an element of structural genius which raises it to the highest art. Forgive the apparent excess of detail which follows, but Act 3 of La Boheme matters. Let's try to keep in mind the twists and turns of the on-off Mimi Rodolfo affair. Rodolfo has left Mimi and has spent the night at a tavern at the gates of Paris, where Marcello and Musetta are also staying. After some bleak scene setting, the bone-numbing cold, the desolation of the urban landscape in winter, Mimi enters and confides her problems in Marcello. He goes to fetch Rodolfo and Mimi hides, later overhearing Rodolfo tell Marcello that Mimi is dying. Mimi and Rodolfo have a scene that starts with her solo and becomes a duet. Marcello and Musetta barge in on the reconciliation and, as Mozart would have said in the movie Amadeus, duet becomes quartet. Mimi and Rodolfo resolve to give it another try, and the scene ends with the cold snap as Winter reclaims her grip. The act opens with that cold snap, which in one second describes the freezing cold, but is also, I believe, you'll see, a metaphor for the bleakness of these young lives. We said that Act 3 was as bleak as Act 2 was festive. The same is true of the tunes. You remember that bright and brassy tune that opened Act 2 in such a blaze of Christmas cheer? Now it returns, stripped of its warmth, to represent the desolation of midwinter. Yeah. 
you remember the warmth and gaiety of Musetta's waltz song. Turns off stage in a bittersweet rendition which replaces gaiety with longing and nostalgia. Mimi enters looking for Marcello. She wants his help in separating from Rodolfo. He comes out of the inn and she explains that Rodolfo's jealousy is tearing them apart. Mimi hides, Rodolfo blusters onto the scene with a blustery version of his theme. To complain, he has to leave Mimi for good. In fact, he makes two points. First, that Mimi is a flirt who will look at any man. But you feel the point he really wants to make is that Mimi is desperately ill. Mimi è tanta malata. And that his miserable cold flat and their miserable poverty are what's killing her and their love. The shifting chords in the orchestra as he describes her symptoms are deeply moving and surely the stuff of true music drama. Mimi's cough betrays her and she comes to meet Rodolfo. She has a little aria, Don de Lieta, which is more than that. It is the take-off point for the great quartet which will complete the act. In it, she sings of former happiness and asks Rodolfo to return her few possessions. Listen to the gentle, wistful reminder in the orchestra of the They Call Me Mimi theme, remembered from happier times.
solo becomes duet when Rodolfo joins in to sing farewell to their dreams of happiness together. When Marcello and Musetta, the earth couple if you like, burst out of the tavern, vocally brawling, duet becomes a quartet, which will occupy the rest of the act. And in the course of it, Mimi and Rodolfo agree to give it another try, at least until spring. But the last word lies with the orchestra, and it is a repeat of that cold snap, which, without being too fanciful, seems to tell us that the last word in this act, in this opera, goes to cold and the misery of poverty. The fourth and final act of La Boheme concerns itself with the inevitable death of Mimi and takes place back in the garret where it all began. The act opens, as did the first one, with Marcello and Rodolfo on stage working, and they have a duet which is rightly considered one of the finest tenor baritone duets in opera. In it, Rodolfo sings of Mimi's unfaithful nature and how she is incapable of changing. Oh, Mimi, tu più non torni. And Marcello responds in the same vein about Musetta, the young men's voices weaving and dipping in a ravishingly lovely melody.
There are also elements of gaiety to this act, as Puccini, ever the master of contrast, has moments of horseplay for the students, which throw into relief the darker moments. Indeed, the climax of their fooling about leads to one of those coups de théâtre which are only possible in the opera house. Musetta arrives on the scene to say that Mimi is downstairs, too ill to come up. And listen how, in a single chord, the air of gaiety is dispelled and replaced by one of gloom, which will last now until the end of the opera. <laughs> Colleen, the fourth and perhaps least conspicuous of the four students, has his moment at this point. Money is needed to buy medicine for Mimi, and he gives up his overcoat to be sold. Surely the greatest of sacrifices. The aspiring philosopher sings a sweet little aria bidding farewell to his overcoat. Here is just a little of it. <laughs> Mimi and Rodolfo are tactfully left alone for a while now, and the orchestra movingly recalls for us their former happier times. Mimi has a lovely little phrase, sono andati, are they all gone, which develops into a last tender duet between the lovers.
It is easy in our more cynical age to sneer at these lengthy Victorian death scenes. They were as essential to 19th century operas as sex scenes are to 20th century movies, and just as titillating. Death from one or other infectious disease was an ever-present threat, and people watched these death scenes in awe and dread. We've shown some of the very unconventional methods Puccini uses in this opera. The melody, which is nothing of the kind, merely a single note repeated. The tiny silence, which points up the music to follow. But his greatest, we can't call it a trick, let's say technique, lies in the final pages of this great score. The other members of the young company have returned one by one to the flat, and Rodolfo is upstage looking out of the windows when Mimi's life slips away. Rodolfo is the last to see this, and he responds not with another soaring tenor melody, but, and this is the masterstroke, in speech. What do you mean? Que vuol dire? Why are you looking at me like this? And Marcello responds, Courage, coraggio. The orchestra thunders out the theme of their love against Rodolfo's final anguished cries of Mimi. Mimi. Qual andare venire? Qual guardarmi così? There you have it, the best-loved opera of them all. You know, there was a time, not so many years ago, when it was fashionable among musicians, especially academics and people like that, to sneer at Puccini. One critic famously described Tosca as a shabby little shocker. The belief was that the operas were sentimental and manipulative. Well, what we ask is life without a little, make that a lot, of sentiment. And if being manipulated means having to listen to tunes as moving and glorious as those in La Boheme, then audiences will continue to pack theatres to be manipulated, moved by Puccini's tender masterpiece, La Boheme.